Hey, what's up everybody? I'm Jeff from GIS Chops. In this video, I'm going to be demonstrating the buffer geoprocessing tool. But this video is part of a series, and if you missed the introductory video by finding this one via search, you're gonna wanna go up and check out that little thing that's dropping down right now, and check out the introductory video, and there's a link at the end of that one to this video, so you can get back to this one really easily. It's like a choose your own adventure series. Here are the parameters for the buffer tool. You may notice this little information box up here at the top that says the pairwise buffer tool provides enhanced functionality or performance. Another video in this series discusses the difference between pairwise versus classic geoprocessing tools. You can either hit that little box that's dropping down up there and go watch that one or wait till the end of this video where I have a link to that one as well. Now let's go back to the parameters. If you have more parameters than these, that's because you're lucky enough to have the advanced license level. I'll be going over those advanced parameters a little later. The first of these parameters is the input features. You can quickly hit this drop down and pick a layer from your map, or hit the folder icon and browse your file system for a layer, or there's this pencil icon that allows you to draw points, lines, polygons, and multi-patch features in your map. Let's pick lines. And what happens when I pick lines? It fills buffer input features lines here in the input features. And if you look over here in my map, that actually created a line feature class in my project's default file geodatabase. It also adds this little area with the same tools that are in the create features pane. And it opens up the edit tools down here at the bottom of your map. So you can use those edit tools to start sketching a line to buffer. So it's kind of a quick way to sketch some features to use as your input for your buffer tool. I think that might be useful if you just wanted to maybe sketch a small section of a road or something and use that for your input rather than the whole layer or selected features of your layer. Let's remove that layer and do something different. I want to buffer this lines layer so I'm gonna use the drop down and pick lines to buffer. Notice this little information section that says the input has a selection, records to be processed to. If you have features selected, it's only going to process those selected features. And so this tool gives you a little warning saying, hey, you've got a selection, I'm only gonna work on those two. And that's pretty common for most geoprocessing tools. I, I don't know of any that don't do that. The same thing goes for definition queries, time filters, and range filters. If you have a definition query active on a layer, it's only going to process things that match that query. I'm going to select my points to buffer layer. Then I'm actually going to move one of the points. And if I go back to my geoprocessing pane, that brings up this little information box saying there's pending edits. I can either save those or discard those. But my run button is still active. I can still run the tool. It's just saying that that edit will not get processed. You can either save or discard. I'm going to discard those edits. And then it leaves that box up and saying no pending edits. Next up is the output feature class parameter. You can click in there and type a new feature class and that's going to go in your project's default file geodatabase. Or you can hit the browse button and find a location to put that feature class. Now we need to specify a distance to buffer the features. It defaults to linear unit, but you can change this to be field. If we leave it as linear unit, we specify a distance here and then a unit here. If you leave this as unknown, it's going to default to the input features spatial reference. In my case, that's going to be feet. So I can enter a distance here, and I can either say feet, or you can even do points, decimal degrees, all of these units. Let's say meters. Then if I try to change it back to unknown, it changes to US survey feet because that's my spatial reference. One thing to note about this, if you leave this unknown and your features are in a geographic coordinate system, that's going to default to meters. To demonstrate the field option, I'm going to go back and I'm going to choose my lines to buffer features for input features. I'll leave this the default. And then I'm going to choose field. Using a field to buffer, you have two ways to do it. To show you that, I'm going to open up the attribute table for this layer. I have two fields that I can use to buffer. 
one called buffer this much and one called default disk. The buffer this much field is a text field and I've got units with labels. I've got some bogus units in there to show you what happens when you have that when the system doesn't recognize the units. And then this default disk field just has numbers. It's a long integer field and just has numbers in it. So let's first pick the default disk field and then hit run. I'm going to close the table. So because I had some pretty big distances, I've got a big mess with my resulting buffers. But if I go through and select them, you can see that each is a different size based off of that field. If you use a field that's just a number, it's going to default to the linear unit of the spatial reference of your input features. Now let's run it using that other field. Pick the buffer this much, run it again. So here are the resulting buffers from using that field. Here's 20, it defaulted to 20 feet. Here's 40 feet, 23 meters, all those worked till we got up here to 100 jeffs. Didn't know what to do with jeffs, so it used 100 feet. Up here I used 50 chops, didn't know what to do with that, so I used 50 feet. And here I used 0 0.01 kilometer, it recognized that. Here I used 20 rods, but it didn't recognize rods. I don't know what are the valid linear units you can use in that. I couldn't find it anywhere in the documentation. So Esri, that's something you can do. Update that documentation with valid linear units we can use in that field. Here I've got 25 kilometers. You can tell that that's not 25 kilometers. It's 25 feet. Again, kilometers, KM, is not a valid abbreviation of kilometers. And then this last one is 0.1 miles, and you can see that's clearly a tenth of a mile. 528 feet. Now I'm going to open up the attribute table for the resulting buffers for that. It created two fields for us, buff dist and org fid. Created those two fields, then populated this buff dist field with the distance that it buffered, taking those units I supplied in that field and converting them into the spatial reference of the output features. The org fid field is the feature ID for the original feature. If I explore this 0.01 kilometer line, it shows me that the object ID for that feature is 19. And if I look for the 0.01 kilometer line right here, the original FID is 19. So you can use that field in a join or a relate back to the original features. If you're interested in a series of videos about joins and relates, let me know down in the comments. One more consideration for buffering distances. If you're buffering polygons, a negative buffer distance results in a buffer that's inside the polygon. So if your buffer distance is larger than the inside of your polygon, that's going to create an empty geometry. The detail window after the tool is run is going to warn you that some features were not buffered because it resulted in an empty geometry. So let's try that out. I'm going to use this polygon layer for my input features. So I need to select polygons to buffer if I can find it. There it is. Now because I had a field specified in a field that isn't there, it's given me a warning there. I'm going to go back to linear unit. We're going to buffer a negative 30 feet and run that. And it's kind of hard to see the new polygon because it's the same color as the original polygons. So I'm turning that off. If I zoom in, you can see this narrow strip because it was not as wide as 30 feet, got cut out. The islands, these sections got cut out. Now if we come up here to my, I had a polygon here. If I turn that back on again. I had a polygon here, but it's not in the buffer layer. If I look at this details, skipping feature 44 because a negative or a very small distance resulted in no geometry. So that's the negative buffer distance buffers the inside of the polygons. The next parameter in line is the method parameter. With that one, you have geodesic or planar. 
I've created another video that goes into the difference between those two, so stick around to the end of this video for a link to that one. This last parameter is the dissolve type. No dissolve is the default, and that's the option that I've been using in all my previous demos. What you get with the no dissolve option is each input feature gets its own buffered feature in the output feature class. Here are all my features with a no dissolve buffer. If I select these, each one is its own feature even if they overlap. Notice these line layers overlap at the ends, and these two point feature buffers overlap as well. The no dissolve option is the only option that gives you those two fields we talked about earlier, the buff dist and the org fid fields. This next option, dissolve all output features into a single feature, that's going to take all of the input features that get processed and buffer them into one single feature. I'll turn off these no dissolve features and turn on my dissolve features. Now if I select them, you get all the features buffered into one. Here are the lines, and then the points are all buffered into one single feature. Now if I explore this line buffer, notice it doesn't give us any fields, not just the buff dist and org fid, but it doesn't give us any of the fields from the original features. That's because it took all of the features and couldn't grab all those different attributes and put them into the resulting table. So you just get the shape length and shape area. This last option, dissolve features using the listed field's unique values or combination of values. Incidentally, that option wins the longest option name I've ever read. This option allows you to choose one or more fields where the unique combination of the values of that field or fields gets dissolved into one feature in the resulting feature class. For example, this points feature, when I open the attribute table, has two fields, name and type. When I dissolve these, I'm going to use the combination of those two fields, and then it's going to buffer the unique combination of those two fields into one feature. So I'm going to select points to buffer, just let it fill in its own output feature class. We'll say 100 in there. Leave the method planar. We've already got this selected. Now we're going to pick name and type. Now I'll run it. While it's running, I'm going to close the attribute table. Now to show you how those things got combined, I'm going to drag my attributes pane over here. Start selecting features. This one was Martha and Red. Both of those points were Martha and Red, so they got combined into one feature. This one was Martha and Blue, and there was only one of those. And there's George and Blue, and there were two of those. Then down here we've got Fred and Red, two of those. The unique combination of those two fields gets its own feature in the resulting feature class. So that's how that option works. Now if we pick a polygon layer, as our input features. We'll switch this back to no dissolve. Notice this side type parameter. I don't think I'm supposed to have that, but it, it has it in there. The documentation says that parameter isn't supposed to be available in the standard license, but it's there. This side type parameter has two options, full and exclude the input polygon from buffer. I'm going to turn off these point buffers that we just did. I'm also going to turn off the original features so you can better see the difference between the full and the exclude types. Here's what the full looks like. So it includes the interior of the input features. And the other side type is exclude the input polygon from buffer. And that's what this looks like. So I turn off the full type, and it's just around the edges, including the donuts if you have donuts. It is not a donut hole, but a smaller donut with its own hole. And our donut is not a hole at all. Look. So the original features are excluded. Now if I select this lake buffer polygon, notice all three of those things are one feature. That's because they came from one feature, that lake feature. So even though there were these two donut holes, they're combined into one feature. Now this last thing we're going to talk about 
are the advanced license level options. These options are the side type and the end type. With line features, you have the option on the side type of left and right, and I'm showing that here in this graphic. The end type is only available for line features, and the options there are flat and round. For polygon layers, you have the options of full and exclude the interior, and I've already shown you that. You can see the directions of my lines indicated by the arrows. The left side buffer is on the left of the line, and the right side buffer is on the right of the line. Full is the default, and round is the default for the end type. That wraps things up for the buffer tool. Let me know in the comments if you learned something new. I'm still able to respond to all of my comments, so drop a comment and let me know what you learned. If you find my videos helpful, it would be helpful to me if you'd give that like button a chop. I'd really appreciate it. I'd also very much appreciate a subscribe. That tells YouTube that my content is worth somebody clicking a button. If you found this demo helpful, here's the intro to this epic series. Here's the difference between pairwise and OG buffer. And then down here is the difference between geodesic and planar. And if that's too many decisions and they freak you out, then here's a playlist right here. Now here's our cute dog just sitting here waiting for you to make that choice. We'll see you next time. One more consideration for bump... <laughs> bumpering?